Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another installment of Washington Business Week's Fall Speaker Series. Special thank you to our sponsor, Pemco Insurance, for their generous support in making this speaker series possible. I want to introduce our panelists. We have on the bottom, Andrea Kikula, Executive Director of Washington Business Week. And back by popular demand, we have Cynthia Sedell with us today. She's founder of On Course College Consulting. She holds a bachelor's degree in honors business admin from the Ivy Business School at Western University in Canada and a Master of Business Administration from Seattle University. And we're very lucky to have Cynthia back with us and she enjoys matching students with the right college as well as helping families understand their options for financing higher education. And welcome back, Cynthia. And thank you again for being with us and I will pass it on to you. Okay, thank you so much, Jenna. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so as we go through um, about the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be presenting some basic information about college planning. I tend to include a lot of links in my slides. So the slide deck will be available along with the recording on the Washington Business Week site. So don't worry about trying to write things down furiously. Um, the other thing is I may not cover absolutely every detail on the slides because I know you can go back later and reference things like that. So I'll try to cover the overview of the information that I'd love for you guys to have. Um, and you can always feel free to reach out to me afterwards by email. My email will be on the last slide if you still have any questions. So what, what I'll be talking about in the next half hour or so is these general items, um, COVID impact, because COVID is still impacting higher ed, it's impacting everything. Um, we'll be talking about grades, rigor, test scores, all of these factors that go into applications, um, as well as the things that go into choosing where to apply in the first place, so major college list, financial issues, um, the applications, and then um, a timeline and resources that can be helpful. So in terms of what's changed, as you guys all know, uncertainty is the new norm. Everything changes so much these days. So um, keeping on top of information and changes has been um, kind of the job of the college consultant this year, just to understand what the implications are at various colleges and for kids, what are we, what's changing because things are changing quickly. Um, one of the big things that, just like high schools, it's really variable in which schools are offering in-person versus online classes. Um, even the school calendar is changing. So varying infection rates. Some states are requiring 14 day quarantines in dorms in order to start in-person classes. Um, as many of you know, it's kind of hard to visit colleges in person at this point. Um, and there are a lot of changes in admissions considerations. So that's the bad stuff. The good things are all of these uh, resources that used to require visits to colleges in person are now virtual. And in some ways, we're all asking, why wasn't this happening before? It's just so logical. Now you can go on the admissions websites of most colleges and find links to virtual tours, information sessions from admissions, information sessions that are specific to certain majors, um, sessions with students doing Q&A, all sorts of really helpful and really impactful resources that you can just access online. Um, the last point that I have that's changed is there's greater flexibility. The admissions reps who are making the decisions on admissions are going through this as well. So we've all, everybody has been impacted by COVID in some way. And I think it's made um, greater awareness that we need to be flexible. Things are changing and happening. And most colleges have the outlook, sorry, the outlook that they're trying to admit. They're not trying to find reasons not to admit students. So flexibility has definitely increased. So in terms of what's still the same, just like COVID, um, the bottom line is colleges are still looking for the same thing. They want to know if students can do the work, if they'll stay, in other words, graduate within four years, hopefully, or five, or maybe six. They also tend to want to know how students are unique. So they, they typically want to build a class of students that has a lot of unique characteristics. They don't want everybody to be the same. They want people who are great in certain sports, in music, in arts, in STEM, in you name it, a big variety. Um, um, good or bad, other things colleges want to know is, is your GPA high enough that it will boost our average so that will look good to next year's applicate or um, applying students. And scores we'll talk about later. Um, whether they're going to be an issue or not in future years is still kind of a question mark. And of course, good or bad, colleges want to know how much students can pay. Many colleges are still needing to pay the bills, obviously, and focused on the bottom line. Um, what else is still the same is that students should still be focused on what their needs are. They can sometimes feel like you're just hoping a college will accept you. And there's so much hype around, will I get in? 
but I, I always try to get students to, to be aware that you're the buyer. You are actually making the decision of what college you're going to accept to be the place where you'll be for the next four years, typically. Um, will they give you what you need? So that is at a very beginning level, do they have the major that you want? Will you be able to graduate there and leverage that education into the career that you have in mind or the next steps that you want, if it's grad school or whatever it may be? So can that college give you what it is that you need? Um, and then is it a good fit in terms of not only the academics, but the culture? Do you want to live there for four years? Will it be the environment that you can thrive in? And of course, um, can you afford it or is it going to break the bank? That is very important. So grades, rigor, and test scores. So grades and rigor are always the number one consideration. Um, and grades, that's pretty straightforward, but rigor refers to whether you're taking advanced classes. And advanced can look like AP exams or AP courses, I should say, IB courses, running start, honors classes. Um, if your high school doesn't offer a lot of these, that's okay. Colleges look at it in perspective of the school you came from. If your school does offer a lot of AP classes, they're going to want to see that you've challenged yourself and taken a few that will um, give you the chance to really explore college level work. It doesn't mean you have to take 13 AP classes. It really doesn't. Um, but it does mean that if, for example, you're applying to engineering, they probably want to see that you've challenged yourself in the areas of, um, say, calculus or physics, um, anything related to the major that you want to be pursuing in college. Test blind and test optional. So these are words that um, have definitely entered the vocabulary of most people this year, anyone, anyone interested in applying to colleges. So testing refers to ACT and SAT scores, and most colleges in the past required scores. And they're operated by private companies, ACT or College Board, which does SAT, and colleges require your score to be considered, and it's considered in admissions. Um, given that this year it's been virtually impossible for students to get these tests done, it's, um, it's, it's still, it's possible in some places, but it's never certain. Um, scores or um, testings are being canceled at the last minute even based on COVID infection rates in the area. So most colleges this year have gone test optional, almost all of them, where if you choose to submit your scores, they will be considered. And if you don't, that's okay. They'll look at other criteria. Um, so generally, as a rule, you want to submit your scores to these test optional schools only if they're going to be um, showing you in a favorable light. So if your scores are above the 50% uh, range of scores for existing students at that college. You can usually find that on their admissions website, by the way. Then you should probably submit them. But if you happen to be below that 50th percentile and it's test optional, don't submit them. They probably will not be um, in your favor to do so. When a college is test blind, that means they will not look at test scores at all. Um, so there are quite a few colleges this year, Cal Poly, um, Washington State, that will not even look at test scores just to try to level the playing field because so many kids have been unable to get them. College data contains uh, one kind of a one-stop shop if you wanna look up where all of your colleges fall in terms of their averages for test scores. And these are just um, places where you can get up-to-date information on ACT and SAT exam status. And subject tests um, are, they used to be required more with COVID, it's become much less common for colleges to request them or certainly require them. Um, but they may come back in importance over time. So changing gears a little, choosing your major. It's really important, of course, that what you major in is something that you want to explore more about, something that you love. So generally ask students um, when trying to determine a major, what do you like? What, what are you interested in? What do you do in your free time? What fascinates you? If you're doing a Google search, what are you searching for? Like, what kind of stuff is just really something you're curious about? Um, and those are all possible avenues to take for deciding what to major in. Um, other tools are the ones listed on this slide that you can use. And um, Cal Poly, for example, is all about emerging markets. So careers in areas, sustainability is one. A lot of STEM fields are listed there. Things that are growing or new areas to explore a career in. Uh, the other ones are other more broad focuses on how to choose a major. So when you're building your college list, assuming you've already got your major decided, or at least somewhat reasonably 
narrow down when you're cho choosing which colleges. Um, some good questions to ask were included in the first resource here. And I've got Indiana University, beautiful campus in the background there, and it's their pamphlet that they put together. So it was put together for in-person college visits, things to ask the admissions reps or the leader of the, call the campus tour. You can still use these questions for virtual tours. And never be shy about contacting the admissions reps by email or phone if they provide it. Um, or at college fairs because they want to hear from students. They want to answer questions. And it's usually good questions that are being asked. So when you're building your college list, again, remember you're the buyer, you're the consumer. So, you know, be, be brutal. Do you really get what you want out of this college or does it just have a great name and are your friends applying to it? Um, so really understand what it is that you're going to get that matches what you want at each school. The only other thing I have here is the um, college safety profile. That's one place government site that you can go and just kind of see the safety and the crime data on each campus to compare what the likely safety profile is of the schools you're considering. Two more tools. So like I said, a lot of links on my slides. Hopefully these will be helpful to you. Um, college Navigator and College Data provide a lot of information, like factual data numbers on majors, um, school, the student body, the college itself, all sorts of stuff. So definitely make use of those. Um, in terms of determining other factors to help you decide on which colleges to ultimately, ultimately sorry, apply to, college websites are probably the very best resource. So go to the admissions page early on in your search and see what resources they offer in terms of virtual college um, info sessions, virtual tours, academic specific information, stuff like that. If you go, say you wanted to major in psychology and you search that major under academics on the college website, one of the best things you can do is take a look at the course requirements for that major and then compare that with the other colleges you're looking at. So you get a really good feel for what it would look like, what it would, what you'd be required to take at one college versus another for the same major. There can be a lot of variance there. And that will start getting you uh, much further down the road of really understanding your options and how one college would compare from an academic standpoint. The other really important thing is attending virtual college fairs. At this time of year, there are many. <laughs> so I try to keep my website up to date with um, a lot of virtual college fairs. In the past, there was one big one that would come usually the first weekend in November in Seattle. Um, and they now have four different times that they're doing that because it's nationwide and you can just join from wherever you are. So um, this link down here has a list of the current uh, college fairs going on. So all of those earlier resources I mentioned are great, but they tend to be formal official marketing materials. So along with the things you get in your mailbox or your email, which we all love, um, those are marketing pieces that the colleges put together intentionally to try to sell you on their school, which is important. However, I also think it's important to get a student perspective. So I always encourage you guys to just take a little bit of time and use social media um, in a way that you can, you can hear from students. So whether it's Niche or Unigo or other platforms, YouTube has a lot of great videos. Um, you get a lot of student housing videos and stuff like that um, to really see what the people who are attending that school think about it. Adjusting here to affordability in topics. So the least expensive option for getting a degree is often community colleges. We are very fortunate in Washington State to have an amazingly robust community college system. Uh, so it's, it's in fact very feasible to get an AA degree at many of our community colleges and then transfer to a four-year degree. Some of them like Bellevue College now offer four-year degrees themselves. So there's some very affordable, great local options there. Um, the next least expensive is typically your public and state university. And we have several great options again in our state. Um, the other thing to check out is WUI, and I know who named it that, but WUI stands for Western Undergraduate Exchange, and it refers to our region, um, which goes as far west as Hawaii, north as Alaska, and east um, as far as the Dakotas. The states within that region, um, public universities can choose to participate in the WUI program, and for some or all of their majors, they can offer discounted tuition to residents within those states. So if you find if you go on that site and you find that the major you're interested in is available at a college within the WUI system, 
the tuition will be one and a half times the in-state tuition. So if you were to look at the University of Idaho or Boise State, for example, tuition in Idaho is less expensive significantly than in Washington. So you end up paying about the same as you would at UW, even though you're out of state. So there are some really interesting affordability options that that opens up as well. In terms of out of state, whether public or private, you just want to really uh, be aware of whether the published price in some cases is exactly what you'll pay. But in many cases, there are um, financial aid options for need-based or merit. So the best way to do that is the uh, net price calculator on the financial aid page of the college. And they have a calculator tool that they're required to have. You can plug in your information as far as your family's financial situation, your grades, your test scores, and it'll give you an estimate of how much you're likely to be paying if you attend that school. And last but not least here, something most people don't think about is international. And I'm Canadian, eh? And in Canada, so, so the government does a lot of financing of the universities in Canada, um, including it's, it's, it's subsidized for Canadians, but also in large part for international students. So quite often universities in Canada will be less expensive than going out of state in the US, even for an American citizen. Um, the United Kingdom and Europe also offer some really great um, affordable options. When I say that, it's not usually, um, occasionally it's less than in-state public, but in most cases, it'll be less than out-of-state private or out-of-state public. So it just kind of depends on the colleges you're looking at um, and comparing them with. But there are some interesting options there. In terms of other affordability options, so the Seattle Promise and the Washington College Grant are both need-based programs local within our state that offer great opportunities. So Seattle Promise, at, at this point anyway, is only open to students in the Seattle School District. However, if you're in the Seattle School District, what an awesome opportunity here for the first two years of community college to be free, to be paid for under this, um, and then you can transfer into a four-year university. The Washington College Grant um, is a little bit different. It's also based on uh, financial need. So regardless of what you're looking at in terms of college or affordability, I recommend kind of following this pattern here with your family to talk about finances early on in the process. Um, we all are aware just how expensive colleges are and families um, have different budgets and different ranges that they're able to contribute to each student's education. So knowing that ahead of time can give you a very real, sorry, a more realistic idea about the colleges that you would want to consider on your list. So understanding some of the terminology, starting with cost of attendance, that is the number that you would be expected to pay every year at a college. So the cost of attendance generally includes tuition and fees, room and board, and supplies, plus local travel. It doesn't generally include the flight to get there if it's somewhere out of state, but it includes local bus and stuff like that. So find a time to sit down with your family and really discuss how much they feel they'd be comfortable contributing to your education. Um, so calculate the expected family contribution. There's a link here to help you do that. And then search the net calculator, net price calculator that I mentioned on each college's website to really identify how much each college would likely end up costing you from your individual situation. And then identify whether you should even have it on your list. So I'm a big fan of going to an affordable college. Um, it's much more important to go somewhere where you can affordably attend and graduate without a lot of debt and thrive there and do, you know, really have experiences and really absorb everything that that college can offer you and then graduate and not have a mountain of debt that you have to pay back. Um, so looking at sources of financial aid, so these are links to um, general, the first one is general information because it's a complicated field again, understanding all the different types of aid and that first one gives you explanations of it. FAFSA is the federal version of need-based and that is for US citizens and eligible non-citizens. And it covers not only grants and loans, but work study funds. So Washington State, we're very fortunate to have WASFA, which is for any students who are otherwise not eligible. So DACA, um, or other, there's some other categories who would qualify under WASPA for additional funding in state through these programs. Institutional merit scholarships, this is where the big money is. Typically, when you apply to a college, you will be automatically considered for merit scholarships. And that's where the most money generally comes from. 
from the college itself when they decide to entice a student to come and accept. Um, it's usually the case that you're automatically considered, but I would also recommend checking the website just to make sure. Private scholarships, another source, and these can range massively in terms of the amount of the scholarship, uh, the competition to get it, and they can be very specific. Weirdly, um, when I've searched that, I found one for owners of llamas. I've also found one for women who are over six feet tall. So it's actually <laughs> kind of fun to look in there. Um, and they're not always hard to apply to. Some of them are just sign up, provide your name. Some of them require essays or a video. It, they really range, but there are opportunities and there are scholarships every year that go unclaimed. So I highly, highly recommend checking those out, putting some time into applying to the ones that seem to be reasonably likely that you would qualify for. What do colleges care about when they're deciding? So it always comes down to grades. Grades are always going to be important. And then the rigor, so the level of challenge that you've taken in, your, in the course that you've chosen. Test scores used to be important this year, not so much, but chances are they will be again in the future. So if you're in your junior year, um, I don't necessarily recommend running out and getting test prep and taking the exams as soon as you can, but kind of keep an eye on what's going on and um, consider that you might, it might be wise to plan to take them again by, or take them in the first place by next summer. If things are opening up again and colleges seem to be requiring ACT or SAT, and that would be a good timeline to aim for. Activities, most colleges, not all, but most want to see a list of the activities you've been involved in throughout high school. Some require recommendation letters from school counselors and teachers. A lot of them require essays or short answers. So getting to the activity list, it's kind of hard when we're in a pandemic to figure out what you can do. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity to sit back and really value or really consider what do you value? And are your values reflected in what you're spending your time on? So if you're just spending a lot of time on gaming, it's awesome, we all do it, but um, if you could chisel away a little bit of that time for something else that you really are interested in, it might pay back immensely in terms of new things you'll explore or identify as interests and um, eventually launch you into a career in that area possibly. So the essays and short answer questions, um, pretty straightforward. UW was wonderful this year. I think it was the first week of September, they. They finally aligned the number of words for their personal statement with what the Common App asks for. They used to be six, or they used to be 550 for UW, so everybody wrote a separate essay for UW. This year, 650 word essay for UW as well as Common App schools. Um, and they want to know who you are. This is the chance for colleges to get to know more than just what's listed in black and white for number of courses and rigor and grades. They want to know what matters to you, what you're passionate about. Um, new this year is a COVID impact statement. They want to know if you've been significantly impacted by COVID, and there are many, many ways that that could have happened. They want to know how you've been impacted. Um, and additional information is the opportunity on the applications to explain anything that the colleges might have a question about, whether that's an unusual progression between high schools, if you've changed schools a lot, um, if you had a bad grade one year, or a whole year of bad grades. There's often a reason, and this is your chance to explain what why that happened. Um, and then college specific essays and short answers on a lot of the applications. So this is alphabet soup when you're looking at <laughs> when to apply. Rolling, regular decision, early action, early decision. So um, UW is a good example of regular decision in one deadline, it's November 15th and that's it. You have to make that deadline period. Other schools have rolling admissions like um, many schools actually where you can apply anytime and you generally hear back pretty quickly, usually within a few weeks. And they generally continue to accept applicants until they're full or until the summer, and it varies. And the websites of each college outline that pretty clearly. So I kind of look at the differences when you have options of um, schools with rolling admissions, awesome. It's like a relationship where you're just friends. You're applying, you're just friends, you're kind of checking them out. Regular decision like UW, you're still just friends, you're just checking them out. You're applying, could be a good fit, but there's no big commitment. Schools that have early action generally have two things. They have an early, early uh, or sorry, regular decision deadline that's typically in January. And then they often have an early action deadline, which is often November 1st or 15th. And for students who apply earlier, it's kind of indicating to the college that you're kind of ready to be in a relationship with them. 
you're, you're making this commitment to get it all done early, you're putting in the effort early, and they will reach her and let you know early, typically by the end of, no, or sorry, usually by, by the end of December, you'll hear back from those colleges. For colleges that have an early decision option, that's a much bigger deal. If you apply early decision, and you can only choose one to apply early decision to, because it's like a marriage proposal, you apply, and if they accept, you're in it together. <laughs> you're committed. And you pretty much have to cancel your applications to all those other schools. So um, those in a cascading order of significance, um, you just want to be really selective. If you're choosing to apply early decision somewhere, you have to really know that's where you want to be. So the next three slides contain detailed um, things about what you should be doing at any given point in time. And I won't go over each line item because I know you can look at those later. Just kind of a checklist of the activities that would be good to be working on at these times. So the summer before senior year is when a lot of this stuff happens with applications. Hopefully you'll have finalized your college list and you'll actively be working on those essays so that you don't have to do the work during the first quarter or semester of senior year, which is when you're filing all the applications and, and eventually making a decision. So some additional resources that I've provided here, um, NACAC has found, NACAC is a National Association of College Admissions Consultants, which is why we use the acronym. Um, <coughs> they provide up-to-date information provided by the colleges on an enormous amount of things. So information sessions, tours, all the application requirements and deadlines, which have been in motion and changing through COVID. So that's kind of a one-stop shop to get a lot of really current good data. Um, my website contains updates, but I try to keep really updated on what's going on with um, college fairs, other resources. There's a glossary of terms to get through some of the alphabet soup of college admissions. And you can always just um, send me a message through the website if you have any questions. Uh, Inside Higher Ed is a free publication that contains current information and news in higher education. So a lot of really good information there if you just go to their website as well. And that brings me to the end of the official presentation. Um, my website is there. Definitely feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And um, as you can see, there are a lot of links on my slides. So I hope you'll be able to access those on the Washington Business Week website. Cynthia, thank you so much. That was incredibly valuable information for our students who want to continue on to college after high school. And we get, we'll have this information available for people who want to know more, um, especially with all those links, really valuable information. So thank you so much again. I um, want to see if you have some time for some questions from our students who have seen you before. Uh, in regard to this information, I, I know you've touched on a lot of it. And I think something that maybe we could talk a little more about um, what if there are students who just don't think college is for them? Um, should they wait? Is that just personal preference? If, what if their, their parents are really dead set on them going to college? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, there are a lot of paths in life. You don't necessarily have to go to college, but you also may decide later on that it's a great thing to do. So life isn't linear. We don't all follow the same path. And sometimes it seems like that's the expectation. But... Um, I think it's worth considering college and really understanding why you would or would not want to consider going to college right after high school. Um, really sitting down with parents as well to discuss that because parents generally want the best for their kids and they have years of experience and perspective to contribute to that it's worth having an, an honest conversation about the pros and cons of putting off college or not going versus going ahead and doing that. Which ties into another student's question. Is it ever too late to decide to go to college? Not at all. I actually went back and got my MBA at Seattle U. Um, I think I graduated in 2014, so I was old by then. So no, it's never too late to go back, whether for your first degree or a later degree. In fact, the way the world is now, um, continuing education is the norm. So most people working in any, any kind of um, knowledge-based or professional capacity probably are doing continuing education either going back for certificate programs or webinars or training, if not initial or, or follow-up degree. So no, it's never too late. <laughs> and maybe if you know, do you know if tuition has decreased in price because of being virtual? Uh, so the occasional college has, but it's really, so the expenses on the college side really have not decreased. So they haven't generally been 
dropping the prices. So if you think about it, the faculty are still having to produce the information on the curriculum. They're producing the courses, they're delivering the courses, they're, they're interacting with students the same, not the same way, but in the same amounts. But on top of that, they're having to change their entire curriculum delivery to an online format. And colleges are having to invest in um, information technology that they just didn't have to have before. So in most cases, um, weirdly, college expenses have gone up because of this. And they're just not in a position to lower the costs. Um, you know, the good thing is a lot of students are able to stay home this year, good or bad, but you can, it's one way to save a lot of money on room and board and travel this year. I think a question a lot of them also um, were indicating is, are all colleges created equal? So if you got a business a degree at Harvard compared to a public school, will your job um, opportunities be different? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I am of the firm belief that it's not where you go, it's what you do when you're there. It's, it's not about the name. And you know, there's exceptions to that rule in some cases, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But generally speaking, employers when you graduate are going to be looking for somebody who's able to do the work. They're going to be looking for somebody who's really put themselves out there and taken initiative during college. So if you go to a school where it's a good fit and you're a really good match with the level of rigor, the environment at the college and the affordability so that you're not struggling every day to survive because it's not affordable, you're going to be able to really take full advantage of everything offered in that college experience. And that's gonna make you a great employee. That's gonna make you more hireable and more interesting to those employers when you come out of college. There are exceptions. So the really elite consulting firms, um, the financial industry, so investment banking, they're going to be recruiting at particular colleges that in that case, they're often Ivy League. However, I think if you know what major you're interested in, and if you have some idea of the kind of industry or, or job you'd like to work in when you graduate, asking your colleges that you're interested in, which companies recruit there can give you a lot of information. So Boeing, for example, recruits a lot locally because they have so many local uh, facilities. And it really can vary significantly by industry, by company, by job type. Um, so it's not ever something that I would say every student should look at Ivy League schools because that's where the best outcomes are. Not at all. Some general questions um, about your profession. Um, any advice that you would give to our young entrepreneurs who want to start their own foundation or their own organization? Oh, okay. So it really depends. I mean, I think. So my, my career path has been, I would, yeah, it's totally taken turns at every junction and um, my career started when I was seven and I started working in apple packing plant my family business um, after school we, we were in the country so we took a bus and we would get off the bus and we'd go to work on the packing line and that was I worked for 40 cents an hour so I had no idea what I would do but I knew I did not want to work in a factory when I grew up <laughs> so you know different jobs along the way I worked in a restaurant and I was a receptionist all sorts of part-time jobs growing up so I really attribute the path that I got on to what I did when I was in high school and younger. So um, I really just took opportunities as they came along. So interesting jobs, some were really awful jobs. And, <laughs> and, uh, but that opened up possibilities. And just an example, when I was in undergraduate in business school, I had taken a course in Russian culture because it sounded interesting. But okay, I need one elective in this area, it sounds good. And that opened up possibilities for me when, um, when there was a group within my business school um, teaching business in Russia, I was selected to go and I taught business in Russia as my first job after undergrad when it was still the Soviet Union. So things like that, just um, one of my biggest recommendations for preparing for a career, and it's really hard to know at this age what career you'll end up in. And you'll probably end up in a whole bunch of different careers over the course of your life take advantage of opportunities that come up. Just don't, don't think of all the reasons not to do something. Think of the few reasons why it could be a really cool opportunity and just go with it. And that kind of builds on um, another question we had for you. With any extracurriculars you can recommend for students currently who, who want to do something similar to you, who want to go in, into consulting or a business-focused industry? Yeah. Um, 
So there are a lot of different extracurriculars. So DECA comes to mind immediately as for business experience and opportunities. But not all schools offer a DECA program and um, or not all have the opportunity to fit that into your academic courses. Um, so anything that involves leadership, for example, is a great preparation for going into business or having any role in consulting or even working with people. So leadership takes a lot of forms. It does not necessarily mean being the president of a club, which kind of comes to mind, but leadership can take forms of just being the person who influences the group in a positive way, introduces new thoughts or ideas, or really takes people or a group into a new direction. Um, so, and that can come naturally when you're doing something that you love and you're passionate about. Well, that was all the questions we have at this time for you, Cynthia. Thank you so much again for this valuable information. And again, um, we'll have this available to everybody. And uh, lastly, thank you as well to PEMCO again for sponsoring the fall uh, speaker series. And anything else you want to leave us with at this time, Cynthia? No, just thanks for the opportunity. I'm a big fan of Washington Business Week, have been for years, and I love being involved. Thank you.